Welcome to all of you, wherever you may be watching from and whatever time of day it is. My name is Dan Natale, and I'm the managing partner of Siegel LLP in Toronto, Canada. I will be setting the stage for this session entitled Building a Global Future. I'm going to kick off with some comments about trends in real estate and construction and the current environment we are in. Then we'll get into our plan session. The only constant today is change. Changes to the economic environment and technology are impacting all of us in more ways that I can mention today. ESG matters. We need to consider the environment, climate change, conservation, social issues, racism, poverty, inequality, communities, and finally governance, ethics, quality management, financial success, data security, treatment of employees, all critically important issues. For the first time in our history, there are six generations living at the same time, but there are two I'd like to focus your attention on now. And why is that? Because millennials, and to a lesser extent, Gen Z, will use and incorporate technology and new financial tools to further democratize and expand accessibility to real estate investment assets. It's very clear the real estate sector is not immune to these changes in society. Real estate executives must accept and adapt to be successful in today's changing world. We are here today to share some new and exciting ideas, some new concepts and thought leadership on some of these topics. Our panel today will delve into a number of areas that are evolving and that require real estate professionals to reconsider how they approach issues such as raising capital or providing liquidity to commercial real estate owners, identifying countries and regions that are open to and suitable for future capital investment, hiring and promoting future leaders while promoting gender and racial equality, considering the environment when looking at new construction techniques, and finally, looking at alternative sources of raising capital. So let's get started and let's be open to some new ideas. Let's be open to the magic of accepting and embracing new technology platforms, because what we know is that future consumers of real estate will demand change. Welcome everyone to our session on real estate tokenization. So what are we talking about here? Let's start at the beginning. We are addressing how to hold an ownership interest in a real estate asset class. Tokenization removes barriers to investment and reduces costs to the real estate owner looking to raise capital from their real estate assets. Investors also benefit from this platform when making investments in real estate. This is magic because today the costs to sell an asset are high and the barriers to invest in asset specific real estate are also high. The magic is tokenization. It reduces these barriers. This is truly democratization. Democratization, you will hear this term used frequently when describing this platform and any other platform that utilizes a blockchain, which simply put, creates access to an openly accepted secondary market for the tokenized real estate asset. Our friends in the US will definitely recognize this building. The Empire State Building is listed on the New York Stock Exchange, and it provides investors an opportunity to invest in this iconic landmark exclusively while still having liquidity through the public markets. Wouldn't it be magical if every office tower, residential apartment building, warehouse block, or other real estate asset class could be listed and or sold individually in a public market? and investors can make investments in these assets directly on an asset by asset basis. Tokenization of real estate assets indeed provides this opportunity. On the left, we see our traditional real estate structures. By using the concept of tokenization and the blockchain platform, this will allow individuals to buy and sell interests in standalone real estate assets. This has already been done today one example is the St. Regis Hotel in Aspen, Colorado. No need to look at the details on the slide, but what I would like you to take away from it is that the owners of this hotel use tokenization as a way to raise capital 
through providing individual investors an equity stake in the hotel. The T0 platform facilitated this capital raise. The real estate token is bought and sold on the T0 blockchain. Financial results for this hotel are shared in the normal course and investors can make their decision as to whether to buy, hold, or sell their tokenized asset. And now I would like to have our panelists introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Laurie Stein, a partner at Osler and the corporate group in Toronto. I lead our digital assets and blockchain practice, which is an interdisciplinary team practicing across all of our offices in various specialty areas. Thanks, Laurie. Noah? Thanks for having me, Dan. Yeah, Noah Buxton, Managing Director here at Armanino LLP. Uh, I call myself a reformed attorney with a background in technology uh, and risk assurance. And today I have the pleasure of leading a digital asset practice at Armanino. We get to do nothing but uh, digital assets and blockchain all day, every day. Great, thanks. So let's let's talk about this platform. Why do we think it's magical? Lori? Well, I think that you articulated a lot of the ideas that are really exciting, which is that it's providing access to a whole new generation of investors that will potentially have less money to invest, but will be able to um, gain, you know, fractional interest in real estate all over the world. Something else that's really exciting about it is that it's global in that the blockchain allows for transfers of value to happen on a disintermediated basis between jurisdictions. So there is a whole lot of magic to it. But as we talk about the magic, I really do need to say as a securities lawyer that that there is also a lot of regulatory issues associated with it. So I don't want to get the magic conflated with the jurisdictional requirement of compliance with securities laws. Well, Noah, do, do you think this type of product is going to take away from traditional capital raising platforms? Yeah, I think software eats the world. And I think this is just another example of uh, software eating into uh, another market. Um, you know, I would say also when it comes to the magic, I would sort of layer in some concepts here, right? So if you're just approaching this for the first time, um, what you need to know is that really this all started with Bitcoin and Bitcoin is actually not a dirty word, believe it or not, but the technological recipe um, of Bitcoin actually shows us or has proven over the past decade that ledgers maintained um, in a decentralized way by independent participants is incredibly powerful. And really one of the most fundamental characteristics of blockchains is the ability to tokenize something. Oh boy, now we've lost people, right? But just think of it simply, right? Uh, we've tokenized written letters by creating emails. We've tokenized uh, analog photography and film by creating digital photography. And in all of those cases, we've made that underlying thing, a written letter or a photograph, borderless, digital, persistent, potentially immutable. Um, and so these similar qualities can be granted to lots of other things using blockchain. So, um, you know, I think really the to tokenization is really creation of a digital record. It's actually something that precedes blockchain networks, right? It's just the idea that you can create a digital representation of something, whether it's something in the physical world, something intangible, an ownership interest, and, and preserve it, say, in a database. And so, you know, uh, I think that really this is fundamentally changing or magical, right? Because it does a few different things. You mentioned, right, Dan, it's this uh, means of creating fractional ownership that's really never before been feasible. Um, you can bake compliance requirements, all the things that Lori helps clients with that are pretty complex and get pretty messy pretty quickly. You can bake a lot of that stuff into a token. You can reduce settlement times and you can even do things that seem pretty magical, like automate distributions. There's examples in the real world today, like um, on an energy project where investors are actually getting paid per block. This means every block of transactions that's confirmed on the network, they're receiving a you know, very small potentially, but they're receiving a dividend in real time. So that's pretty powerful. So generally all this stuff is efficiency gaining, right? It's using blockchains, public networks to gain efficiencies. Um, but ultimately it does all these other things like lower the cost of capital, create a wider breadth, you know, breadth of potential investors, um, increase liquidity. Um, and real estate, I think we would agree as an asset class has traditionally been a liquid, right? So that could be really powerful. Um, and maybe even develop new financial products is another thing that can happen here. So. Um, if I can go on a second, I would say the other thing that, that I don't think a lot of times get talk, gets talked about 
is completing the circle here. What, what's the real aha moment is interoperability of these tokens. And what that means is that when I've tokenized this thing, right, I've created a standard template for compliance and investor ownership and share. If I can now take that as a standard across networks and across marketplaces, um, I've just done that. I've democratized what, as you said, Dan, I've imagined if you as an individual today could own a, uh, you could buy a, a public stock certificate, you could actually hold it yourself self-custody. And not only that, you could choose when you want to sell it, you could choose it on many different, uh, choose to sell it on many different exchanges. Um, that completely upends our current thought process around centralized marketplaces, you know, the way that things operate today. Um, and again, absolutely uh, disrupting. The infrastructure for that is, is being built today. And there's lots of good examples of that movement. Um, but again, still being the foundations of this are still being built. So, Laurie, I know you're a, a securities lawyer in Canada, but what are, what are the Canadian regulators telling us telling us about this product? Thanks, Dan. And just I, the reason I was tempered in my comments about the magic is because my day to day is about the regulation. So, my job is to get my clients to tone down the magic a little bit and figure out how to do it in a compliant way. Um, so in Canada, our regulators have really been focused on the crypto assets sector, and they've been looking at it in two different ways. First, we have um, a pretty robust junior public capital markets here where there have been a lot of public issuances of, of digital asset um, businesses, including mining businesses and now some staking businesses and trading platforms different kinds of venture capital investors. And so there are all kinds of disclosure issues that our securities regulators have identified um, really relating to specific risks associated with digital assets that the regulators think all investors should know. And so in mid-March of 2021, after the regulators looked at the public disclosure filings of almost 50 um, reporting issuers that are in this business, they set out a disclosure guidelines and the focus of the disclosure guidelines were on a few areas. The first really was about the custody of the digital assets because custody risk is a huge risk when you're holding digital assets, including, for example, tokenized interest in real estate. Uh, when you own actual real estate, you can actually stand on it. You can see your house. You can look at that title deed that's in some registry office somewhere and you have your lawyers giving you opinions that you own it and you've got title insurance. There are all kinds of ways to protect it. But when it's just a token on a blockchain and it's being held in a digital account, which is commonly known as a wallet, if that wallet is online and connected to the internet, it can get hacked, it can get stolen. And also you as the investor can just lose the private crypto cryptographic key that gives you access to the ability to transfer your asset and it is literally gone. So that's a risk that has been sort of evident at going back to Bitcoin and Noah's earlier comments since the beginning of Bitcoin. Um, and there have been a whole bunch of high profile losses, hacks and thefts that have happened on prominent crypto exchanges. So our securities regulators have said, you know what, if you're going to be raising capital in the public capital markets, your investors need to know exactly how you're providing custody of those digital assets and what the risks are. A second area that's been a huge focus on the disclosure side has been, not surprisingly, audit. Public companies need to provide audited financial statements. How are holdings and digital assets being audited? What are the standards? And the Canadian Public Accountability Board, which is, I'm sure you're a member of it, it's the auditing, it's the group of auditors that are qualified to audit public companies, have published a series of guidance notes over the past few years that are um, directed towards giving guidance to the industry for how these things can be audited, what kinds of internal controls are acceptable, what you have to look at. And a lot of cases in, cut, in the custody, on the custody side, it's very helpful if the custodian can provide an internal controls report known as a SOC report or, or an ISO report, which I think David and Noah, you'll all know more about that than me as the lawyer. But I know that our securities regulators say, if the auditor doesn't have that to rely on, then it better have really well-designed, you know, digital specific 
uh, controls that it's using to audit those digital assets. A third area that's been focused, an area of focus on the public disclosure has been on the type of issuer it is, because there's a risk that issuers that are, um, you know, participating in the digital economy are not really engaging in active businesses. They're really just providing exposure to a new speculative investment asset. And in that case, those issuers would most likely be considered investment funds under securities laws, and they'd have to comply with a whole other disclosure regime. So the securities regulators have said, you know, we're looking at you guys, and if all you're doing is holding a whole bunch of Bitcoin, um, we think you're an investment fund. Real estate's a little bit different because there is a whole other regime that already exists for real estate investment trusts, which are not considered investment funds because real estate assets are real assets and they generate revenues and the real estate investment trust often also has a role in managing the properties, et cetera. So, you know, it'll be interesting to see when more real estate assets get tokenized, how those issuers structure themselves. And I expect that some kind of digital take on the real estate investment trust is going to emerge as a way to solve some of these disclosure issues and I think the related audit audit issues. Just to be complete, and I don't want to hog the show, but the second area that's been a real focus for the regulators, although I think a little bit less relevant to this group, has been a focus on the regulation of the crypto asset trading platforms. So our securities regulators in Canada the first, I think one of the first jurisdictions in the world has taken the position that a trading platform that provides custody services to its clients. So if you're trading in digital assets on a platform and you have an account on that platform and your digital assets are sitting in that account, then you have custody risk to the platform and that platform is it's in Canada needs to get regulated as, as a securities dealer and possibly a securities marketplace. And it's also going to be interesting to see how those requirements play out in the real estate sector, because we've been talking about this opportunity for global markets to emerge, where there's these huge, robust secondary markets, deep liquidity and amazing price discovery for real estate assets from all over the world. But who's going to regulate that marketplace? Whose jurisdiction does it fall under? How does it get decided who gets listed on that platform? In the world of decentralized exchanges, there are no listing standards. There are no decisions being made. Anybody can just throw up a token, create a liquidity pool and allow trading. So the way that securities laws are bumping up against the technology is really interesting. And it's an area that you know certainly has kept, keeps me engaged and keeps my clients sort of trying to get advice on how to comply. No, are, are you hearing the U.S. doing anything differently or same types of issues from a, from a securities point of view? Yeah, I think a lot of the same issues are at play. U.S., um, for sure. Um, Japan, I think Singapore, Switzerland have also sort of issued uh, pronouncements, if not guidance, um, in this area, um, although it still remains, uh, you know, pretty uncertain in a lot of these marketplaces. Generally, uh, you know, I, I like to sort of refocus people on, on the idea that what we're really talking about here, especially when we're talking about tokenizing ownership in, in real estate investments, is putting a digital wrapper around a current structure, right? So in the U.S., a Reg D offering is a very typical way of, you know, LPGP structure of, of having, you know, hundreds of investors in, uh, in a real estate deal. Um, you know, the tokenizing that doesn't really change the reg D, right? It just it just puts a wrapper around it, and so I think ultimately, uh, the regulators across jurisdictions they care about protecting markets and they care about protecting consumers. And it seems most of everything that you know, Lori said, I agree is 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 happening here in the U.S. and is directed really at those sort of two fundamental principles. So you know, I'm I'm listening to the conversation. I think you know, I gave one example of of one real estate asset that got tokenized, and maybe there's you know one or two others. But what's the big pivot? Like, what's what's the thing that's going to happen where it goes from two to fifty to a hundred uh, sort of individual real estate assets that are on a blockchain? Like, what do we what do we think still needs to take place for that to become more prevalent? 
Well, I'd make one point really quickly. I think that if you sort of do research on this topic, you know, who's tokenizing real estate, how much has been tokenized, what's the total, you know, market value of real estate tokenized, it's actually hard to get a good picture of that. I think um, one of the, the recent articles I read said 250 million to 750 million. And I thought, oh my gosh, they're way off, right? Because we had that tokenized years ago. Right. I think the reason that we have limited visibility to this ironically, right? Because isn't this all about creating more visibility in uh, public markets and everything? Um, is that really what we see is um, springing up of tokenization platforms, right? So these businesses are purpose built to offer a technology platform for an issue or an asset manager to come and tokenize again, a reg D deal or some you know trust investment, whatever. Um, and then to manage that from a technology perspective ongoing. What we're also seeing is the other sort of necessary players in this market, you know, the um, the transfer agent, the regulated broker dealer, the custodian, um, they're all in the process of uh, either springing up new businesses or retooling existing operations to become digital, right? Digital custodian, digital transfer agent. They have to be able to interact with these protocols, uh, deal with the, the issues that are unique to holding cryptographic assets um, or tokens. And um, so, yeah, I think what we see is that those tokenization platforms, back to the point here about what's the real market cap here or what's really happening, these tokenization platforms have some really key partnerships with big asset managers, but the deals that they're doing are not public yet, right? You sort of see, oh, they've done a deal, but you don't know exactly what investments they've tokenized yet. And in my estimate, I think we're well over a billion and a half dollars of tokenized real estate already. Um, and that might be pretty conservative. So, you know, one of the one of the benefits is lower cost to transact, right? And I think that is sort of a driver. Um, do we do we do we feel that that is indeed the case based on what we know today? Just to add to that, and I know I'm harping on uh, regulation, but I do think that the markets getting properly regulated is a big precursor to widespread adoption, because especially when you think about institutional investors, their expectations and requirements for regulatory compli compliance for them to have the ability to audit their own assets, to be comfortable that, you know, if an investment decision maker has a fiduciary duty, that they're exercising that duty, those types of investors are not going to go on to, you know, Uniswap, which is the public, uh, which is the decentralized exchange operating on uh, the Ethereum network, not to be confused with its cousin Sushi Swap, which is another decentralized exchange. You're not going to see any regulated pension plans trading real estate tokens on Sushi Swap. Like it's not going to happen. So I think that a big, uh, I think that, that once this market gets regulated and figures out how to do that, and it's going to take some time, um, that will also uh, lower the cost, bring in more. Uh, you know, bigger players, more participants. And just on that point, um, I think one of the things that's interesting about real estate is it's, it's a commodity, you know? So even though the tokens are securities, the real estate is a commodity. And, um, you know, how those markets are going to be regulated in different jurisdictions remains to be seen. Um, Noah was mentioning that guidance has been published in jurisdictions like Singapore, Japan, Switzerland, but, you know, those jurisdictions in the UK and my familiarity with those jurisdictions is, you know, I know enough to be dangerous, but not enough to say anything intelligent. But they really are, I think, looking at digital assets more as a new thing. Um, they're kind of saying this is outside of the regulatory perimeter of existing securities laws. And we are going to make new laws and make new categories of regulation and registration to you know, facilitate these markets. Whereas in North America, I think that our regulators are saying, no, 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 no. Like Noah said, it's the same thing. It's just a new wrapper. So those approaches are quite different. And I and it, there's not a lot of consensus on some of it. So I think that there's a, a, the next few years, I think the regulatory systems are going to find their way. And my guess is that at the end of the day, Similar investor protections are going to end up being in place, but they will have gotten there by way of very different routes. And once that happens, I think that different parts of the globe are going to figure out how to interact with each other and, and, and again, bring that robustness to the market that we think is really going to be the game changer. 
Yeah, we've we spent some time talking about the benefits to um, you know individual investors to participate in this type of uh, process. But I'm, I'm wondering now about the institutional investor, right? Like that's pretty important in the real estate markets. So there's a lot of institutional capital that's making direct investments. Do we see them being big participators in this type of platform? I can take that. I, I think what you're going to see is a natural distribution of entrance to this this space, right? You're going to have very traditional asset managers, fund managers that uh, won't touch this with a 10 foot pole, so to speak, because they simply can't get their arms around it. They don't understand it. And really their business is fine, right? They're making plenty of good money. They have plenty of happy investors. And in some cases, they might even be searching for new assets to get into a fund. They might even be having trouble on that side of the business. They're not even worried about the efficiency plays of tokenization. So I think what we've seen so far have been sort of, you know, your, your uh, whatever, two, nat- uh, two standard deviations away, right? They're, they're the very early, early adopters. Like um, one of the first uh, ownership interests to be tokenized as an example uh, is um, an interest in Spice VC, which is a blockchain focused venture capital firm, right? So they're very much on the edge. They very much understand this and decided to tokenize, you know, ownership interest in that VC fund. That makes a lot of sense. Then you're going to have, I think, a lot of new market participants, fund managers that are um, probably a little bit younger, probably a little bit better tooled to get into this space that will want to start using these tools to um, to create funds and offer investments. I think the legacy players are those, you know, so the middle of the natural distribution that will trail along, right? When these things are really proven, the compliance is in place, there's plenty of people in the market and a lot of the issues have been tested, then yes, their new, their new funds naturally would go in this direction because it's an efficiency play, right? The platform is secure and reliable and it's cheaper and I've got new investors that are interested in it and a secondary market that's proven. Now it makes sense. So secondary market, that's pretty important. Yeah, absolutely. That's the promise, right? That people talk about with tokenization. And we haven't seen that yet. So to be clear, when you hear people talk about uh, removing liquidity discounts or achieving a liquidity premium on a tokenized ownership interest, we haven't really seen that yet, right? We we really need many more investments tokenized and also many more, I would call them almost like kind investments, right? Investments that in, investors would want to go into a marketplace and trade for one another, right? Um, and we just have, we haven't seen that yet. I think again, the infrastructure, so to speak, is built. There are registered ATS providers or automated trading system providers in the U.S. that have the right licensure. They really just need deal flow. They need they need participants in those markets. Just to add, just to add to that, and like Noah was saying, it really is sort of the very very early adopters that we're seeing the first few transactions. Um, I learned over the weekend that the first real estate collateral has been posted to secure a digital um, token, which is the DAI stable coin on the maker um, maker platform, which is an Ethereum, uh, another Ethereum platform where up till this point, all of the digital, all of the assets that were securing um, the DAI stable coin were Bitcoin, Ether and other crypto assets. And just in the past couple of weeks, I think, There has been real estate that's been deposited to the smart contract and is securing a loan. And my understanding is that the loan value that was taken off the platform was $38,000 worth of dime. So it's small, but it's a start and it's pretty exciting for the developers. Lori, I think this is an amazing point that comes to mind, like just to try and give people the big picture vision here. It's a little bit long term, but what's happening now in hindsight will seem inevitable. This is what I think of as a technology inversion, right? So uh, take us back a little bit, right? Go back with me to the invention of the first automobile. People at that time said, no way I'm gonna use this thing. It's loud, it's obnoxious, it slides all over the muddy road. There's no way to refuel this thing, it's expensive. We have perfectly good horses, right? What happened? Uh, Eventually, enough market participants came in and they paved the roads and they worked on the technology of the car and the price came down as we've talked about and this technology became more accessible. And guess what? Horses run perfectly well on paved roads, right? Voice calls today run perfectly well over the internet. Digital pictures run perfectly well over the internet. So the idea here is that we've inverted, right? We've created a new technological layer which new and old technology can run on. 
So I'll tell you today, it's happening. Over the next five to 10 years, public equities, as well as all these private securities will run on blockchains. This is the disruption of capital markets using blockchains. And again, in hindsight, it will seem inevitable. You know, I think uh, when we think about, you know, this technology, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm sitting here wondering, you know, are we uh, three years too early talking about this? And I think, Noah, what you're suggesting is we're not, right? Like it's, it's the time to be aware of the platform, the product is today in order to get ready for what's coming. Yeah, not to hog all the airtime here, but my perspective is that, you know, as um, one of the most powerful accounting networks in the world and as individual firms, right, more global, I think we should really be thinking about this. We should be thinking about the way this specific tokenization of real estate and other assets, but also uh, sort of the family of things of digital assets, how this changes our industry, right? How do we... Um, how do we service clients in a new way? Um, you know, I tell my team that the auditor of the future looks a lot more like a computer scientist background than they do a business and accounting major background. And I think so that's already happening. That That's happening in our businesses today. Um, and so, yeah, I, I don't think it's too early to think about how we deal with change in our own industry and in, in our clients marketplaces for sure not. Um, it's it's great to have a panel that of, of what I would say is you know industry experts in your own fields as it relates to this, and it's great to be part of a discussion that for me is really sort of cutting edge. Uh, you know, um, people are going to be looking to this, and you know we'll reflect back on this time in a, in a couple of years' time and saying you know why didn't we try and deal with this sooner? Because it's something that's coming, and it ain't going to stop. So thank you very much for, for taking the time and uh, sharing some of your stories with us today. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Dan.